This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Stick around to the end of the video for a special offer they're making available through my channel. So I've got a Game of the Year video coming. This isn't it. In fact, if I don't mention a game in this video, it's probably because it's on my Game of the Year list, so I'll talk about that later. This is just me wanting to look back on what was a pretty fucking crazy year in the world of video games. 2020 didn't turn out anything like we expected in real life or in gaming, and I think it's just fun to look back and talk about the year that was. Anyway, let's get started. January began with Warcraft Reforged. Now, I never pre-order video games, but this was the one game I pre-ordered because I was like, how much can you fuck up Warcraft 3? Turns out you can fuck it up quite a bit if you try, or specifically if you don't try. Plenty of ink and bandwidth has been spilled on this topic, so I'm not going to go through it all again. But I will say that Blizzard's reputation has suffered massively with the fallout from the botched Diablo Immortal announcement, the disastrous Blitzchung affair, the underpaying of staff, and the exodus of their senior leadership owing to the corporatization of the company under Activision. A bunch of Blizzard's greybeards, including former CEO and Blizzard co-founder Mike Morham, have recently started a new publisher called Dreamhaven with two newly formed studios under it. It mirrors the exodus of senior Bioware staff over the last few years, some of whom have gone on to form new studios like Yellow Brick Games and Archetype Entertainment. Point is, there's a changing of the guard going on over at Blizzard, and they're not handling it very well. Blizzard used to feel like this golden goose, but now it kind of feels like a bit of a lame duck. Dreams came out in February. Kotaku recently did an excellent piece detailing the fact that the Dreams community is shrinking. There's just not enough eyeballs in there at the moment to justify the work that goes into these creations, especially when they can't be monetized without Media Molecule's express permission. I mean, I love Dreams when I spend time with it, but it's clearly the sort of thing that's only going to appeal to a really niche audience, or if someone makes like the next Among Us in Dreams, and we all have to reinstall it to play it. But even then, you get the feeling that if anything does get big in Dreams, someone will just copy it and release it on mobile or whatever. It's sad to see something so worthwhile not enjoying the success it deserves. Neo 2 came out in February. I played it and finished it. I actually did a 50 minute long review for it and that's sitting right now on my channel, but I never published it because I hated that review. I was trying to do one of my old style skill up videos, you know, the ones I'm talking about. I just realized that my content is different today, and that video felt really unnatural and forced. I've been on YouTube for five years now, and you don't really plan to change, but you do. At least most of us do if you want to stick around. Anyway, Neo 2 is really good, and you should play it when the complete edition comes out next year. Doom Eternal came out. I really liked Doom Eternal, but I preferred Doom 2016 because its combat flow gave me more freedom, and I much preferred the overall tone and approach to storytelling. Still, that video is the most disliked video I did this year because I didn't like the Marauder, and I dared say so. The Marauder was actually the most interesting part of Doom Eternal, not from a gameplay perspective, but because of what it evoked in the discourse, where if you didn't like the design of the Marauder, people interpreted that to mean that you were bad at the game and you were essentially asking for Doom Eternal to be easier. Now, I wasn't saying that the Marauder was that hard. It was a little bit hard, but that wasn't the issue. I just saying I didn't like him, right? Anyway, it's kind of surprising to me that Doom Eternal wasn't on more Game of the Year lists given its critical reception. <laughs> Half-Life Alex came out. I haven't played it yet and that really bums me out. People were thinking that Alex might be the start of like mainstream VR and you know like VR is finally going to take off as a result of Half-Life Alex. VR has been growing just fine without Half-Life's help. Go look at like the VR YouTube scene and you'll see how much it's blowing up. The future of VR isn't Half-Life 4 or Halo 7. It's some dude wearing a Pickle Rick skin running a game show guest starring AOC, Tom Holland and Lil Nas. I don't think it's particularly insightful to say that Animal Crossing arrived at the perfect time when vast swathes of humanity were locked away in their homes, haunted by the existential dread of the viral apocalypse. For many, it was nice to see fake sunshine and have animal friends and be in a place where the biggest inconvenience you'll face was forgetting to craft fish bait so you can catch fake fish. Personally, I don't like Animal Crossing, but I'm glad it was there for those that needed it. Did you know that the highest rated game on Metacritic this year is Persona 5 Royal with a score of 95? 
really should play that. Resident Evil 3 came out in April. My review of that game was also one of my most disliked videos of the year. That video came out right on the embargo when a lot of people just couldn't believe that Resident Evil 3 wasn't that great after Resident Evil 2 blew everyone away and was on many, many Game of the Year lists. Since then, I feel like public perception has really swung around on that one. I mean, no one's out here asking for Resident Evil 3 Remake to be on a Game of the Year list, right? Gears Tactics came out and no one really expected anything from it, but it was awesome and you should play it. It's just been released on console and it's on Game Pass. Bleeding Edge is a game that really bums me out. When is the last time you heard anything about this game? It barely got a mention when it was released and since then it feels like everyone has totally forgotten that it existed. Clearly a lot of work went into this product, but it just didn't differentiate itself enough in the crowded hero brawler genre, and absolutely no marketing dollars were put into it. It's hard to see a future for this game. Oh, and Streets of Rage 4 came out. Everyone loved this game. I didn't play it, it's on my pile of shame. Deep Rock Galactic was in early access for a long time and everyone loved it. I picked it up when it released in 1.0 and I loved it as well. What's great about Deep Rock is you feel like you're with your buddies even if you've just been match made with people a few moments earlier. All the dwarves have this boisterous personality and they all seem so happy and excited to be doing what they're doing and they all just cheer each other on. During lockdown, I felt like Deep Rock Galactic filled the void for me that Animal Crossing filled for everybody else. <laughs> Crucible. Remember this? Probably not. This was Amazon's big entry into video games after setting up new studios and committing to making AAA games right out of the gate. It was very clear that Crucible was not ready for launch, but the higher-ups saw the potential of a captive audience because of the worldwide lockdown. Video game metrics were going through the fucking roof and Amazon wanted a chunk of that change. What Amazon would quickly learn is that lockdown makes good games more popular and it offers absolutely no help whatsoever to shitty games. Crucible's launch was so disastrous that I said in my review, remove all of the game modes. And then they did that. And then I was like, take this game down and put it back in beta. And then they did that. And then Amazon pulled the plug on it entirely and now the game is finished. Which is not something I suggested, but you know what? That was Uncle Jeff's call, I guess. Amazon would go on to delay their other major project, an MMO by the name of New World. To be honest, this one also looks a little bit concerning because they've pretty much rebooted the core identity of the game over the last few months and they're still planning on releasing next year. Amazon's foray into core gaming has been a disaster and it proves that all the money in the world doesn't make a good game. Valorant came out in June, remember that? I remember very big expectations for this game, like it would somehow compete with Fortnite or whatever and be the next IT game that content creators would build their careers on. It didn't turn out that way. Valorant exists and it's growing, but it's doing so as a competitive game that's quite separate from the rest of core gaming. Do you know anyone that plays Valorant? If you watch this channel, you probably don't. The point is, Valorant's doing just fine, and it's got a bright future ahead of it, but it is a reminder of just how segmented this hobby of ours is. Persona 4 Gold released on Steam, and it was one of the best-selling games of the year on the platform. As a result, Sega were like, whoa, we had no idea it would be this successful. We better port more titles to PC. Yeah, no fucking shit, guys. Last of Us 2. Where the fuck do you begin with this? The Last of Us 2 was pretty much the worst video game discourse I've ever seen in my entire time playing games or reading about games or covering games. It wasn't just the homophobes and the anti-Semites and the transphobes, although that was definitely a thing. It wasn't just toxic fandoms unable to process story decisions they didn't agree with. It was also like Sony, who was abusing DMCA to remove videos that were simply talking about spoilers. It was Naughty Dog developers who post or tweet things to further chum the waters. It was games media lumping legitimate criticism of this game in with the oh they must also be transphobes bucket, which happened to me a lot because I was critical of the game. No one emerged from The Last of Us 2 with their dignity intact, which is just 
you know, really, really sad. I, I wish I could say that we're unlikely to see a repeat of this, but the only thing I can guarantee is that we are definitely going to see a repeat of this, because social media is a space where outrage can be monetized, and a lot of people may bank by making other people very angry about The Last of Us 2. Personally, I did not enjoy the game, but I congratulate the staff on Naughty Dog for making a Game of the Year winner and putting up with all the bullshit that got thrown at them. This was also the year that E3 was cancelled, and no one really cared. I get why no one cares, because it doesn't affect most people. And the ESA is a garbage organisation that lobbies to protect loot boxes. And everyone likes to say that E3 is irrelevant because you get all the news from press conferences anyway, and so many of the publishers don't turn up anymore, yada yada. All that's true. But let me tell you, E3 matters a lot. For over 25 years, the games industry has looked to this space as the preeminent event to showcase the very best, the most exciting, the most ambitious stuff that the video game industry has been working on. The industry collectively inhales in the month before so that it can bellow out as loudly as possible in those three days. And even before I ever stepped foot on the E3 show floor, those three days were like Christmas for me as I bought magazines the month after when that's all there was and I waited for screenshots to load over a dial-up modem and I discovered an up-and-coming gaming website by the name of IGN who had an entire section of their site devoted to E3 coverage. Whatever form E3 takes in future, whoever runs it, whoever turns up, I'll never be so cynical as to not be excited for those three days. Here's a feel-good story. Death Stranding was released on PC and it's at a 93% positive rating on Steam. I've always maintained that history would be kind to Death Stranding. This game really was a fucking masterpiece and I will not be taking any questions at this time. Oof. The reveal of Halo Infinite did not go very well. If you've been following Halo's development, you'd know that it's been anything but smooth, with plenty of churn in key leadership positions. This gameplay reveal went so badly for 343 that even more leadership changes were made, and the game was delayed from being an Xbox Series X launch title to being slated for Holiday 2021. Personally, I'm very concerned about this game, and I'm keeping my hype well and truly in check. But I can say that I also don't really care that much about Halo at this point, and I think Xbox will be just fine if Halo Infinite bombs. They have Forza, which is the best racing game on the market. They have Ori, they have Ninja Theory, they have Obsidian, who are working on a Bethesda-style open-world game, and they have Bethesda, who we hope are also working on Bethesda-style open-world games. The point is that Halo isn't what it used to be, and the future of Xbox isn't nearly as bound up in the Halo franchise as it once was. Look, this ad campaign fucking sucked. It was peak activist capitalism, framing their business dispute as some sort of classless struggle. Hashtag free Fortnite, give me a break. However, Tim Sweeney had a point. The fact that these platforms are charging 30% of revenue is crazy. And I'm not going into bat for billion dollar epic here, but my concern is indie developers, small studios struggling to keep the lights on. Imagine if you worked for years on an idea, sacrificed everything, mortgaged your home, gave up time with your kids only for Apple to take a third of your earnings because they have a monopoly on the shop front. It's interesting to note that Apple have relented here, lowering their cut for smaller developers from 30% to 15%. That mirrors what Valve did after Epic began competing with the Epic Games Store, offering a substantially better split to developers. I think Epic's campaign was gross and exploitative and icky, it was bad, okay? But I very much agree with the goal of a better split for game developers, and I absolutely take my hat off to Epic and to Tim Sweeney for getting two of the biggest software storefronts on the planet to move. <laughs> Dude, Fall Guys was so good. Even my wife liked Fall Guys, and she fucking hates video games. She hates video games, right? But even she liked Fall Guys. I remember playing Fall Guys in 2019 at E3 and thinking, hey, that's cute. Not really my thing, but good luck to them. Sure enough, Fall Guys and their Twitter account took over the world. Animal Crossing was the quarantine game that people played at the start to kind of relax and settle in. But after a few months of being at home, people just wanted to party. And Fall Guys was like the party everyone needed. They really, really need to bring this game to mobile. 
Ubisoft released a battle royale game called Hyperscape. If you haven't heard of it, that's because no one's talking about it and very few people are playing it. Hyperscape was like Unreal Tournament meets Apex Legends. It's just that I guess people were over the battle royale thing. Given how little buzz there is for this at the moment, I wouldn't bet big dollars on this one going the distance. Microsoft Flight Simulator is a game I got excited to boot up. I turned on the graphical settings to max and got like six frames a second on my 2080 Ti. I spent about 15 minutes trying to figure out how to take off before eventually giving up and going to play more Fall Guys. Still, in a year when no one was allowed to travel overseas, I was always jealous of people who knew how to use this thing well and could like buzz the Colosseum and the Eiffel Tower. That certainly would have been fun. August was also the month when Among Us took off. If Animal Crossing was chill times and Fall Guys was party times, then Among Us allowed us to live out the murderous fantasies we were quietly harboring as the effects of global cabin fever set in more deeply. Among Us is a gaming phenomenon unlike anything we've seen before, pulling in core gamers, casual gamers, non-gamers, celebrities, politicians, at a time when social interaction with those outside of the house was basically impossible, Among Us worked because it was kind of a board game you could play over the internet. And the fact that it was made by a team of three people who are now all probably driving solid gold Rolls Royces makes Among Us one of the feel-good stories of the year. Even though it's a game based entirely on murdering and lying to your friends. Crusader Kings 3 came out and heaps of nerds lost their shit. They loved it. I didn't play it, unfortunately, but apparently it's very good. You know what I did play, though? Look, I don't take any pleasure in the fact that the Avengers cost Square Enix a $63 million loss. That's not good for the publisher because eventually that translates into job losses and pay freezes for hardworking devs. Having said that, Hopefully the Avengers serves as a cautionary tale to other developers that this live service business model where you make a game and just stuff it full of microtransactions, it fucking sucks. You cannot charge us $60 and change for a game and then also charge $20 per skin and $20 for each character's season pass and partner up with every corporation under the sun for exclusive content deals. The core gaming market is just not up for that. It's just stop trying to do this. Go bother mobile gamers, they're up for that. If we have a console or a proper PC, we have these things because we care about this hobby and we are not interested in this bullshit. Anyway, it's a real shame that it went down this way because combat in this game is really good, even if the rest of the game isn't. Paradise Killer is a game that I know almost nothing about other than it gets talked about in the same breath as The Outer Wilds, even though it's a completely different game. That's already enough to pique my interest. A few publications have awarded this game a Game of the Year nomination or a category win, so there's obviously something there. It's on my pile of shame. Speaking of my pile of shame... Of all the games I am pissed off that I skipped this year, 13 Sentinels tops the list. Again, I know very little about this game, other than everyone says it's incredible. It's compared to Nier Automata for the strength of its narrative. Yoko Taro himself has recommended it. This one I will play very soon. I think Genshin Impact was one of the most important and influential games to be released in 2020, but I'm not sure that that's a good thing. This was a game that released simultaneously on PC, console, and mobile, with the same game playable on any of those platforms. It was also free to play, and it was a high quality product that many people really enjoyed. I only played a little bit of it because it's a gacha game and I knew you'd eventually hit the paywall, and people certainly did. But look, all those platforms, including mobile, all at once, that's definitely a thing. That's a big thing that a lot of publishers are going to be paying attention to. Do you have any idea how big mobile revenue is? It's nearly 50% of all game revenue at this point. You think Nier Automata selling 5 million copies is a big deal? Call of Duty Mobile has been downloaded 250 million times since October of last year. This little hobby we have on our consoles and PCs, that's chump change compared to mobile gaming. And Genshin Impact is a model that blurs the line that game publishers hope will disappear entirely over the coming decade. 
trust me, Genshin Impact is going to have vastly more influence on future game development than Hades or God of War or Zelda ever will. No Man's Sky released its Origins update in September and would later go on to deliver a free next-gen upgrade on PS5 and Xbox Series X and then would go on to win the best ongoing game at the Game Awards 2020, something even Sean Murray himself did not expect. Game Award goes to No Man's Sky. Um, I was not expecting that. Uh, amazing. <laughs> no Man's Sky is not a game I love, but it's a story I love. It's a story I reflect on a lot in my line of work, where I'm constantly hooked into social media platforms, all figuring out what to be angry about next. Hello Games and Sean Murray overpromised with their game. Gamers were rightly angry, very angry in fact. And then Sean Murray and Hello Games put their heads down and they just worked their asses off. And since then they have delivered dozens of patches and three headline content updates that have expanded and changed the game massively, and they've not asked for a single dime the entire time. There are no microtransactions in that game, and they've never once charged for new content. We all make mistakes in life, and developers are no different. I think the measure of a person or an entity or whatever is not how perfect they are, but how earnest they are in their desire to recover and learn from mistakes. In this regard, there are few better examples than the likes of Sean Murray and Hello Games. I truly admire what this team has done, and I definitely plan to return to No Man's Sky one day to see if the changes might click with me, since this feels like a game worth giving another chance. September was the month that Microsoft bought Bethesda for $7.5 billion. No one saw this coming because that's crazy. I mean, Bethesda has some of the most valuable IP in video games. Elder Scrolls, Fallout, Doom, Wolfenstein, Dishonored, Prey, Commander Keen. And now they all belong to Uncle Phil. I didn't see this coming, but I definitely thought that Bethesda was cash starved because Fallout 76 existed as a microtransaction platform. And when they started charging a subscription for it, I was like, holy shit, Bethesda must be desperate. Starfield is not soon, and Elder Scrolls 6 will be lucky if we're alive by the time that comes out. Bethesda needed cash, and Microsoft came to the rescue. It was weird to see the internet do all these sorts of mental gymnastics to convince themselves that Microsoft wouldn't make Bethesda games exclusive to Xbox and PC ecosystems. Like, why would they spend $7.5 if that wasn't going to happen? It will happen. And it's a good thing that it happens because first-party console exclusives are good for this industry because they drive competition between major players. Sony's first-party lineup completely dumpsters Microsoft's at this point, and that's not good for gaming. You want both of these companies in fighting form so they're coming up with all sorts of crazy shit to one-up each other and we end up getting better deals. That's what this purchase does for Microsoft. It puts them in fighting form and I'm totally down for that. If you haven't played Star Wars Squadrons, you really should, especially if you have a VR headset and joystick. Ironically enough, EA were like, no, Squadrons is not a live service game and it will not get additional content, which is like the least EA thing to say ever. But it was so good that people were like, give us more content. And EA's like, all right, here's some more content and it's free. And everyone was really confused. I don't know what sort of incriminating Andy Wilson compromise the team at EA Motive have locked in their vault, but keep it safe and keep the Squadrons content coming. This game was awesome. The new consoles launched in November, and no one could get their hands on one. Thanks, scalpers. You know what's interesting about this console launch? It's not that this is the last console launch, because it's not, there'll definitely be another one. It's the fact that for the first time, these two titans were running very different races. Microsoft doesn't really care if you buy an Xbox Series X or S or whatever. They'll get you somehow, either through Windows or Game Pass or Project X Cloud, where all you'll need is either a mobile phone or a little USB stick that you plug into your TV and boom, you've got an Xbox now. They're positioning for a post-console world where the ecosystem matters far more than the hardware. Sony, 
they're kicking it old school for now. They do care about you buying that hardware. They aren't really interested in ecosystems. They just want to keep you locked to their box with the very best exclusive content that the world of video games has to offer. And damn if that strategy isn't paying off big time at the moment. There's no winner or loser this console generation launch because both of these manufacturers have their own strategies and both of these strategies are working out just well. You have to say hats off to Ubisoft. Valhalla has been a monumental success for Ubi, both commercially and critically. The game really resonated with a lot of people who feel like it fixed a lot of what was wrong with Odyssey. Obviously, I don't share that view and a lot of other people don't either. The thing is, I don't think most people who don't enjoy it are saying it's terrible. They're just saying that it wears out its welcome. According to PSN and Xbox achievements, only 14% of players have finished the final zone, which is basically the end of the game. That's low. The people that loved Assassin's Creed this year versus the people that didn't, they aren't really that far apart, I don't think. I still believe that Ubisoft are on the cusp of greatness with this franchise, and that had they shown the restraint and focus that Ghost of Tsushima did, everyone would be singing its praises. Oh, and by the way, they added the XP booster microtransaction after the review cycle finished. Nice move, Ubi. Very classy. Nope. I feel like there's never been a more forgettable Call of Duty than Black Ops Cold War. And part of that is the fact that Modern Warfare was just so damn good that many people feel like this was a step down. I don't know, Call of Duty Mobile really feels like the future of this franchise to be honest, so I wouldn't expect huge things from Call of Duty over the next 10 years, but we'll see. Did you know that WoW Shadowlands was the fastest selling PC game of all time when it launched in November, shifting 3.7 million copies in a day? That's fucking crazy. Do you know which game held that record before that? Diablo 3. That record stood for 8 years and only a World of Warcraft expansion could beat it. It really makes you think about those tired arguments that like, World of Warcraft is dead. It is very, very much alive. <laughs> So, remember when I said at the start of this video that if a game was on this list, it's not on my game of the year list. Well, Cyberpunk isn't on my game of the year list. Not because it wasn't one of the best games I played this year, because frankly speaking it was. But it's because I feel shitty putting it on there after how all of this went down. I did not put up my review for the game on the embargo because I couldn't agree to CD Projekt Red's ridiculous NDA that prohibited me from using my own footage and also gave us no access to console code. I sort of had it in my mind that the console release was probably going to be not great, but absolutely nowhere near what console people would finally experience. As a reviewer, CD Projekt Red took me for a ride, and my review, which is an accurate review of the PC version of the game, is just flooded with hatred, accusing me of selling out to CD Projekt Red and just, you know, fucking getting the yellow chair. I didn't even get the fucking yellow chair, but it's every second comment, the yellow, any fucking yellow chair. I get why people are frustrated, because if I bought the game on PS4 and experienced all that bullshit, and then I saw a really glowing review, I'd be like, what the fuck, dude? There are really two versions of Cyberpunk. There's the PC version on high-end hardware, and then there's everything else, with the console releases being so bad that Sony pulled the game from the PSN and retailers are pulling it from shelves. 2020 was a mixed year for video games, but it made me genuinely sad to see a studio that a lot of us trusted cash in on that trust to sell us a lemon. The hardworking developers are not to blame for this. They've all been through so much, including Extended Crunch, which large sections of the internet argue didn't happen and everyone became experts in Polish labor law overnight. The staff did crunch and the game was pushed out by management before it was ready. And as a result, CD Projekt Red squandered 20 years of goodwill in a week. It's a very sad story. I do think it's important though to remember that CD Projekt Red were trying to make a good single player game that you pay 60 bucks for and that's that. They weren't trying to make some scummy microtransaction platform to rake in billions through pay to win and loot boxes. I am reminded of what I said earlier about Halo games. No person, no developer is perfect. And I think the measure of CD Projekt Red will be how they respond to this crisis, especially as they look to roll out next gen updates and the long promised multiplayer mode. Either way, Cyberpunk doesn't deserve any Game of the Year accolades after the way CD Projekt Red treated so many of its consumers this release.
If I were to guess the legacy of 2020 when it comes to video games, I'd say the most important trend is the way that the world turned to video games to comfort them and keep them occupied when we all needed comforting and occupation. There were other options, books, movies, Netflix, browsing social media, talking to your family, lol jokes, but video games were the thing. The metrics went through the roof across the board. The gaming industry has never had a year like this, and games like Animal Crossing and Fall Guys and Among Us became phenomena that expanded the industry, but also expanded its significance, its impact, its cultural footprint. Games is always on this journey toward being taken seriously outside of the people who already know that it's a serious thing, and you get the feeling that a lot of headway was made this year. Most of 2020 was pretty shit, but at least we got some good games and plenty of time to play them. 2021 is fast approaching, which means you might be thinking about a business idea or a side project or whatever. And if any of that involves a website, then look no further than Squarespace. Squarespace takes all the complexity out of building professional looking websites. You just select a template from dozens upon dozens of choices. You customize it to meet your needs using the intuitive editing tools and voila, you have a website that looks like you had some professional web design company built it when really it was just you sitting at home in your PJs. Squarespace websites aren't only about looking good though. They also have all the best features and tools. They have things like a members area so you can publish exclusive content or communicate directly with your community. They have traffic overview tools so you can see how your website is performing and they have full integration with social media platforms so you can share your content instantly. To get started, visit squarespace.com and when you're ready to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up for a 10% discount on your first purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.